everybody. Welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas. I just killed my target. <laughs> Today, we are taking a look at the Berthier model 1907-15 or 1907-15. This is a very interesting one. This is one of the primary rifles of the French army of the First World War, uh, served in tandem with the LaBelle model 1886. Um, these came in obviously partway through the war as it is a 1915 design. Uh, this one is dated 1916 actually. Got equipped a cut down Rosalie bayonet. This is actually a kind of a rare variation. Uh, the uh, cast iron handle examples are not very common. We'll be taking a look more at bayonets when we go into the gun room and we'll also be bringing out the other bayonet for the second part of the video. Probably not going to bother setting the target back up. This just wallops it too hard. So when we do come back, I'll probably just be shooting at the tree that it was previously attached to. It is accurate. I can hit with it. It just uh, kind of annihilates targets in the short range. We're only about 50 yards from our target. This is as far up into the woods as I could get. I almost got stuck here. Uh, actually, I did get stuck for like an hour, but I was able to dig myself out. Wasn't fun. But anyway... Let's go ahead and go into the gun room and talk some World War I French history. To unpack the history of the Berthier Model 1907-15, we're going to be reaching all the way back to the dawn of smokeless powder. Uh, as interestingly, the 1907-15, the longest rifle that I own, began its uh, journey to becoming what you see before us here, as a cavalry carbine. So, um, how this came to be. As most of us are aware, in 1886, the French developed the 8mm Lebel, the world's first small bore smokeless powder cartridge. This kind of set uh, the world on fire, really. And uh, to uh, not mince words, it was a big deal. <laughs> it, um, you had everybody trying to figure out what to do with this this huge leap in firearms technology and the French didn't really have uh, all the answers right out of the gate either. They introduced it with the LaBelle Model 1886 which was great for a uh, infantry rifle but had some uh, genuine problems and or concerns when it came to the cavalry. Around the same time Ferdinand Monlicker was developing his famous Monlicker style feeding system and this is important as it was uh, something that was taken note of by one Andre Berthier. The fact that we're talking about a Berthier rifle should denote the importance of this man. So the French, as I said, were trying to figure out a way to uh, to implement the new smokeless powder uh, in to their cavalry as shortening the LaBelle rifle didn't really do enough for the cavalry. It was too heavy. It was kind of unwieldy to load. It just was a pain. So they, they wanted something that they could either go back to the earlier uh, Gras rifle, the single shot, or um, do a completely new design. And so they formed a committee, the, uh, I, I believe it's just called the Cavalry Rifle Committee. And uh, the company Puteau, the Puteau Arsenal, through André Berthier, put forward a design that was essentially a modified Berthier 1886 that could accept instead of uh, through a Kropacek style tube magazine, that, that could accept end block clips. I believe the the first design was a four round. This design was uh, rejected, but uh, some interest was shown. So a year later, they uh, kind of reworked it to make it lighter. The, the rejection was mostly based on the weight of the thing. So a, a year later, they re, um, introduced a second attempt that, uh, again, a little more interest was shown, but it still didn't wind up getting adopted. This time their problem was that this one was a five-rounder with a extended magazine and uh, 
for the cavalry, they did not like the extended magazine as this uh, would rub on clothing and just uh, provided another extrusion from the rifle. And that was something that they didn't really want to deal with. So reworked the rifle again, and this next one stuck, the Model 1890 Berthier Cavalry Carbine. This thing was like 37 inches long. It was like literally three feet long, a tiny little thing. I... Uh, but it could accept a three round clip of which stuck around clear up until the uh the model 1907 15. and that is the seed for how the 1907-15 came to be where you get the name 1907-15 uh again going back to the 1890 model you had the cavalry carbine and it went through multiple different iterations uh uh, I, I have no idea how to say French uh, pronunciations for some of these words, so I'm, I'm apologizing for that here and now. But the Quirisiers, I think is w which one it was, and I think is how you say their name. French heavy armored cavalry had their own variation that had a hard leather butt plate because, you know, steel cuirass, steel butt plate doesn't really add or um, lead to a secure... Uh, mount when firing so they, they had their own model the gendarmerie had their own model that was actually the first one that it had a bayonet lug the earlier models did not that that one is the uh, model 1892 i believe uh cn arsenal does an awesome uh overview of the 1892 specifically but eventually this would lead to the model 1907 colonial rifle of which for all intents and purposes is this this is a direct modification of the 1907 Colonial Rifle. Now, how we got from the Colonial Rifle to the 0715 Infantry Rifle is a direct result of World War I. So when World War I kicked off, the French were uh, using the Lebel as their standard infantry rifle, and the demands of the war were such that, um, as well-armed as they were, they still fell behind. All the older uh, Berthier models came out as substandards, but it was realized pretty quickly, uh, as early as late 1914, in fact, that these were way cheaper and easier to produce uh, and faster than the Lebel was. The Lebel was expensive, heavy, Took a long time to load. Uh, it's eight rounds, so when you're fully loaded, it's great. But then when you got to reload, it it takes you know you, you may as well be firing single shots at that point because loading that eight round tube magazine is a pain. And this just seemed like it would be a good alternative to bring the 1907 Colonial rifle out in force. So by late 1914 the all the major french arsenals were tooling up to begin producing a modified version of the 1907 this would become the 190715 as you see before us here there were primarily three modifications first bolt handle on the 07 is a curved bolt handle they decided to straighten this and thicken it a bit it's a, it's a pretty beefy bolt Second, and most importantly, the barrel was overhauled to accept the famed Rosalie. I've already shown you one of these briefly, and uh, we've got two different variations of it. This is early example. This is a later example. This would be technically uh, Rosalie 1886 uh, 15. I, I believe they called this a Model 1915, in fact. We'll get a little more into the bayonets when we go to the tabletop view, but they overhauled the front end to accept the new bayonet. In that overhaul, they altered the stacking rod. The stacking rod previously was mounted a little higher and was this kind of swooping, weird-looking thing. Uh, you can see a good close-up of that in Forgotten Weapons overview of the 0715. So... New bayonet attachment to accept the standard infantry bayonet. And uh, that kind of led to, over time, 
these barrels would be standardized to be the exact same as a Labelle 1886 barrel. So they, they would be interchangeable because a lot of both 0715s and Labelle rifles are being damaged throughout the war and being sent in for repairs. It's kind of nonsensical to have two guns chambered in the same caliber using two different barrels that you have to produce separately. So streamline the process. I'm not 100% certain if this one is one of those standardized ones, as this is in 1916. From what I've heard, what is definite is that by 1917, they were certainly standardized. Could have been as early as 1916. Not certain. I, I don't really have a way of knowing. But uh, it wouldn't really wind up mattering for the story of this rifle, as by 1917, uh, by spring, I believe it was, they had officially started phasing these out for the Modifi 1916, which we've already taken a look at in the past, and like it was one of the earlier ones we did actually, but I will be posting a link to that video's description in this one, as that would be the rifle and carbine that would replace this. Now, during World War I, there were four primary manufacturers. You had the two major state arsenals of Sanatien, which this one right here, I believe, is... Yes, it is indeed. Uh, it is written on the side. Again, we'll take a closer look when we get to the tabletop. Then you had Chatel who made less. Uh, they were focused more on making carbines, of which there is a carbine va uh, variant of this rifle. And then a luxury French car manufacturer. Uh, I've got their name written down. It's an interesting one. Uh, Delaunay Belleville, I think is how it is said, or Beauville. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, again. French, French pronunciations. I apparently can't even pronounce the word French right now. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I'm just tired. But anyway. And then uh, your fourth manufacturer was actually Remington out of the U.S. Who would, um, in the end, make a little less than 10,000 that went to France. And, and interesting note on uh, the Remington rifles. First off, as far as uh, ones that were actually used, it was somewhere south of 10,000. It was like 9,400 and something. Second, the French were very upset with Remington's quality. It wasn't all Remington's fault. There's a lot that went into this, but they uh, it wound up being enough of a problem that in August of 1916, the French canceled the order with Remington. Uh, they wanted 100% parts interchangeability, and in order for the Remington rifles to meet this standard, the French were having to overhaul them themselves after having already bought and paid for what was supposed to be a completed rifle. And uh, they just had issues. It, uh, it it led to some some kind of interesting things happening, one of which being Remington Berthiers in the U.S., now, if you are into collecting World War I weaponry and you specifically want a Remington rifle, a Remington Berthier in particular, make uh, absolutely certain that it has a serial number on the barrel shank somewhere. Because uh, that, that is where the French would put this on, uh, on the Remington examples, was on the barrel shank, right? I believe right over here. But they only did this to rifles that they accepted for service. When uh, when the French canceled the order with Remington, Remington was still tooled up to make a lot more of these and had parts or nearly completed rifles for at least a few thousand of them. And what they wound up doing was finishing these rifles and selling them onto the U.S. collector's market. Uh, a lot of them would wind up being sporterized. But where the serial number uh, on the barrel shank comes into play in that side of the story is Remington did not serialize these guns that they kept in the U.S. So if you find one with no uh, printed serial number, it is not a military-issued weapon. The ones that went to France were given a serial number. The ones that did not were not. So if you want one specifically that served overseas, uh, in France, make sure you find one that has a serial number uh, that is, um, you know, a, a French serial number. It, it'll it'll be fairly obvious if it's something that was added uh, post-1968 or if it was what was originally printed on the gun. But the French put the serial numbers on themselves. This was part of how the contract worked at the time. The French wanted to inspect the rifles and then serialize them. 
so they were manufactured without a serial number. And yeah, that, that really, that's as far as we're going to go into the Remington story. There's a lot more to it that is interesting. I would recommend you check out Ian McCollum's video on Forgotten Weapons. He goes into a lot more detail on that side of the story. Now, the 0715 would uh, have a pretty short production run, but a lot of them would be made somewhere between 1.6 and 1.8 million, in fact, with totals coming out to, like we said, a little less than 10,000 for Remington, for Delaney Bellevue, or Belleville, or whatever it is, about 170,000. Chatelarue making uh, about a little over 430,000 and somewhere between 1 million and 1.2 million for Saint-Étienne. Saint-Étienne was focused on the rifles, Chatelarue was focused on the carbines. And that part of the dynamic actually stayed true through the Model 19, or the Modifi 1916. Um, again, we go over that in that video, which is going to be linked in this video's description, because it is pertinent information to this and to the evolution of the Berthier. Uh, the reason that this actually wound up being replaced, oddly enough, is uh, with all the concerns that the cavalry had about the gun being flushed so as to not snag on stuff. They kind of skimped on the uh, capacity for going a five-round rifle for a three-round rifle, which wound up biting them in the behind <laughs> during World War I as the French soldiers were complaining to the highest levels of authority about having too small of an amount of ammunition in what was one of their standard rifles. This did serve in tandem with the Lebel as the standard rifle during World War I, and uh, the Berthier design would stick around clear up until uh, just before World War II broke out, actually, with uh, the Moss 36, of which I have one now, so we will be taking a look at that in the not-too-distant future to continue the story of the evolution of French weaponry. Anyway, it's a very cool piece. I uh, We've really pretty well covered the history of the rifle up to, as you see it here, there would be a number of modifications going through the, uh, the interwar years in the twenties and thirties. We'll take a look a bit at that. And it's stuff that was done to all French guns that stayed in service, actually stuff like the ball and ammo man, uh, modification of which both this example and my 1916 example have, uh, is the modification for ball N, which is simply, essentially just they reamed out the throat a bit to accept a slightly uh, longer uh, new version of the 8mm Lebel cartridge. And if it does not have that stamp that indicates that it was modified for ball N ammo, you should not be shooting it, <laughs> at least not with uh, ammo that you bought over the counter. If you know how to produce your own ball M ammo, for instance, or or one of the earlier uh, round nose variations, by all means, go right ahead. I, I ain't gonna tell you what to do. I try and shoot everything that I have, for example, but when it comes to French weapons, if you want to shoot it, you wanna look first for that N stamp, and then there's a number of uh, other small things that were done to different models of the gun, but that really is the most notable post-war modification of the 0715 is the modification for the new cartridge. They were often reblued, refitted. A lot of times you'll see them very mismatched if they went through the overhaul process because they just really didn't care about keeping serial numbers likened together when they, uh, when they read, uh, we arsenal these guns, they just wanted parts that worked. So if it worked, it was put back together in a package that worked. This is one that went through all of the French overhaul, overhaul programs, but it appears that it probably came into the U.S. during the Second World War or pre-1968 because there is no import mark on it that I can find anywhere, which I am happy about. Anyway, enough of that. Got a few markings to look at. Getting the bolt out of these things is a pain, so I'm going to show you how to do that, and we were going to take a closer look at the bayonets. So let's go ahead and go to the tabletop. We're going to try and keep this segment short and sweet, as this is already approaching the longest video we've ever done, Mark. We had said that we were going to take a look at bayonets. So, got two different variations. This first one here is a early 
1886 Epi bayonet. Once again, I'm sorry if I butcher French pronunciations here, but it just is what it is. I don't speak French. These early ones are very long, and you will see they have this, uh, they call it a German silver handle. It's a nickel alloy, and the hooked quillion. And then the attachment point here is really quite shallow. There's not a lot of movement. This one had been struck by a bullet. I had to do a bit of grinding to get it uh, back into shape that it could actually go on the gun. Um, did a pretty good job of not destroying it while maintaining the fact that this thing had been clearly struck by a bullet right there. But anyway, these early ones are rather weak, actually. The attachment point is uh, just right in here. The, the, uh, uh, the cruciform spike is screwed in, so the tang is basically non-existent. You can quickly identify an early one by the butt end of it. If it just has this dot here, that is what the tang is screwed into, of which, again, the tang is, to say not even a, a half tang, would be uh, probably being generous. But the French had a nickname for these. They called them Rosalie. I think I have said that a couple times already up to this point, and will probably say it again. The Germans had their own nickname for them. They called them French knitting needles. And uh, these early ones, like I say, they, they have a couple of problems. The length actually was problematic in itself. They had a tendency to break or bend. A lot of times you can see... Uh, uh, imperfections in the metal where it was heated to be re-straightened. They had a tendency to snap, and that was one of three reasons that these would be shortened to something a little more like this one. This one's got about a 16-inch spike. This is a cast iron handle, and you can see on the butt end looks a little bit different. That is because these are now a full tang. You will also see these with a brass handle. The cast iron is actually a lot less common. They extended the travel of the locking latch here and got rid of the hook. Uh, that was something, the hook quillion is something that most countries kind of started shying away from during World War I. Ones that were cut down, again there were basically three reasons that they would be cut down. One was it bent or broke. Two, if they stuck around in the French military post-World War I, a lot of times they got cut down, and this is an example that appears to be that. They're cut to about 16 inches, it would be a uniform length, and then they uh, often blued anything that was left in the white. So as you can see, the blade on the original is left in the white. This would have probably originally been as well, but they went back and blued them when they cut them down. The third reason would be if it went into German hands, uh, they had their own uniform length that they cut these down to. So, French Epi Rosalie bayonets. And quick note, Epi, from my understanding, means fencing sword. If you want to know more about these bayonets, I actually have a channel recommendation. It's a fairly small channel. A uh, friend of our channel, in fact. Pointy, not sharp. He does a pretty good video reviewing the model 1886 Epi Rosalie bayonets. Now, markings. Well, I've got a couple that we're really going to stop and note here. I'd mentioned the N stamp. It'll be on the receiver and the barrel. This is something that was done in usually in uh, the 30s. Uh, but all through the 20s and 30s, as we'd said, these went through a lot of upgrades. That was one of them. And then you're going to have the MAS is going to be your Sonatien shorthand marking. Uh, it's upside down here, but there's not a lot that I can do about that. You've got a kind of cons confined space, but it's going to be written in kind of fancy cursive scroll on the left side of the receiver. And then you'll have markings on the barrel denoting which company produced it. This is uh, also where you're going to see your date. is going to be on the right side of the barrel. This one is a 1916. Bolt removal. We never looked at this with the Model 1916, or the Modifi 1916. I keep on calling it Model. It's M1916, but 
again, just watch that video and you will understand more. We never did look at how to remove these bolts and you're gonna have to pull this screw out to do so. It's not usually gonna be locked in very tightly and you don't even have to pull it all the way out really, you just need to get it fairly loose because what you're doing is just taking off the bolt head. So the bolt head locks this in. So once you've got your screw loose, there's a track right in here. You can just rotate and then pull it free. Now your bolt will come the rest of the way out. Pretty easy. There's no safety or anything to mess with here. The French were not particularly fond of safeties <laughs> as they really didn't put them on anything. Now to put this back in, just gonna stick it in and rotate it. You can see this piece right here has a notch that it travels into. Once you've got that back in place, you can tighten this screw back down. And it doesn't need to be especially tight, just tight enough that it stays. And I think that will about do it. Let's go ahead and take this thing back out to the range and put a few more rounds through it. Loading the berthier is going to be much like loading anything of a uh, Monlicker origin in design. So you're just going to open the bolt and then you've got your end block. These are a three round end block, which is weird. It's the only gun that I'm aware of that is three rounds in a block is the berthier. Uh, earlier versions of the berthier included in that but you're just gonna put it in and shove it down until it locks. You can eject the full block with the way I just did with that button right there, just in front of the trigger. So, so you can see that again. And this has a pretty positive ejection on this one, actually. Uh, my five round, I've actually kind of had problems with that. It tends to get stuck. This one, I have the opposite problem. I've had the clip fly out while I was in the middle of chambering the second round or something. Uh, or just ejected the first round and then the rest of the block just pew. I actually think I have an example of that happening on video and I might stick it uh, after this as a little blooper but anyway then from there it's just a bolt action there is no safety on this we've gone over this already I believe but the French did not really like their safeties and equipped we have got the very long early Labelle Rosalie or Epi bayonet Again, pardon my French. <laughs> I, I am not very good at uh, pronouncing French words. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and shoot a tree. Didn't bother hanging the target back up. As I said, I probably wouldn't because I'll just knock it down again. So here we go. clip falls out the bottom of the gun, this slot right here that you see. Again, a lot of this is stuff that we've gone over in some capacity already. You can drop the hammer by simply pulling the trigger and guiding it down. Anyway, someone is showing up here, so hope you all enjoyed the video. It's been Thomas, Great Northwest Weapon, and we'll see you next time.